Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I wasn't going to say it's our first Sunday school of the year, but we've had a number of Sunday schools. But we're back to the pattern of having on the first Lord's Day of every month, and, and some others. Today isn't the first Lord's Day, but Pastor Sam is away. So, but typically, uh, on the first Lord's Day of the month, I will take Sunday school. And just to remind us, it's been a long time. It's last year. We were last year. We're looking at this book, What Happens When We Worship, by Jonathan Laundry Cruz. Very helpful book. And I would recommend it to you, how, as I have before, to read that book. Not necessarily to bring it and follow along, because you'll get a little confused. So I'm not able to cover everything that's in the book. But I'm trying to convey the thoughts of the author, uh, especially as they align with the Word of God, and teach us a little bit more about our worship, that we may value the Lord's Day more. And uh, we've had five lessons in, and if you missed some of those, just read the first few chapters in, in this book. Um, and we're in the section entitled in the book, The Theology of Worship. And, and there are six chapters, I think, on the theology of worship. And we're just doing one concept every time. What happens when we worship? The theology of worship. What do we mean by that? What God teaches in his word regarding the worship of his people to himself. So that's what we mean by the theology of worship. Additional reading, which I mentioned at the beginning, A.W. A. Tozer's book on on uh, worship, and there's a book by John MacArthur, which I have not read. I've, I've read bits of it on the ultimate priority worship. Um, what happens when we worship the theology of worship? The first part of the theology of the worship, the first lesson, worship is the most important thing we'll ever do. And we briefly looked at man was created to worship God. And worship on earth is preparation for eternity. And today we'll see a little bit about its uh, participation, if you like, in that eternal worship is what we'll see today in a sense. The second part of what happens when we worship is we are being shaped. And we talked about man becomes what he, uh, man, man kind of becomes what he worships. And as we worship God, we become more like him because we were created to worship God, because we were created in his own image, and so we uh, become shaped more like him. And we talked a little bit about the power of liturgy and structure in worship and how that can help us, but there's more about the technical side of worship in subsequent lessons. So today we're in part three of the theology of worship, and it is simply this, and they are short, small concepts, large concepts, but uh, brief points, if you like. What happens when we worship the theology of worship? We meet with God. We meet with God. And that's all that we want to press to our consciences and to our minds today. These are not just words, and we need to think about this clearly. Just think about that for a minute, when we worship, we meet with God. The scriptures throughout teach us that this is where the creatures can meet God. That's what the scriptures say throughout. In worship, in the gathered worship of him, in the prescribed way, and we'll talk about that in, in the, the subsequent lessons, as I said, uh, which we'll consider there. But for today, let's consider that when we gather on God's appointed day to worship Him, God is there. God is there. We meet with God. We literally come into His presence. When we gather in the church service, we are given the opportunity to come before the living God, the creator of the universe, the holy, self-sufficient, and transcendent God is literally meeting with us. That's what the scriptures teach. And if this were not true, our worship would kind of, to say it reverently, be a waste of time because it's not a particularly auspicious occasion. 
But if we truly are meeting with God, this is important. Because we meet with God, this changes everything. And we need to think about that. Let me quote from the book, Corporate worship becomes the greatest means of making us into what we were always meant to be, image bearers of God. We are reflective creatures who become like what we behold. We looked at that last time. And in Christian worship, we behold God. Let's consider this morning exactly what it means that God is present in our worship. And you may immediately ask the question, well, what does this, are we not limiting God? Is this not implying that we cannot meet God or encounter Him at any other place or at any other time. Well, we certainly can't confine God to any particular place. And this is not what we are saying, for God is omnipresent. He's everywhere present. He is even in hell, in judgment. He is everywhere. This is one of His essential attributes, and we've looked at this in our Sunday school with Pastor Sam in our confession of faith, there is nowhere where God is not. The classic passage, of course, is Psalm 139. Let me remind you of those verses 7 to 10. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the utmost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. So God is everywhere, and God is with us everywhere. So what I'm saying, we're not meeting then with God. God says, you meet with me on the Lord's day and in his house in a special way. And furthermore, all things, of course, are from him and to him, and in him all things hold together. And that's Romans 12, 11, 36. To him be glory forever and ever. In Colossians 1.17, if you're taking notes, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Can we confine God to a place and say it is in our worship where we meet with God? That's what his word says. That's what his word says. And we're not denying his presence everywhere. Rather, the point is God does not promise to meet with people everywhere. Have you thought about that? God is everywhere but he doesn't promise to meet with people everywhere. And these Christians today, <laughs> mostly Christians who think themselves Christians, I don't need the church, the hypocrisy. It's like a club. I don't need it. I just need to be alone. Put me in Montana, on the top of a hill, and look at the stars. There I'll meet with God. God does not promise to meet you there. You may run into your doctor at the grocery store, but he's not going to meet with you. He's not going to examine you. For that, you need to make an appointment. And, and I realize that's just a human illustration, but I'm sure you get the point. This is where he is guaranteed where he may be found. It is in the worship where we will know for certain that we will meet with God. And that should change everything about our attitude, about our preparation, about the actual worship service. God is outside, yes. When I'm driving, God is with me. But he's not meeting with me. It is here, in his house, the gathered people of God, where we meet with him. When you're present with those who praise and adore God, when you're present with those who acknowledge their sin, who thank him, for his dying and his rising son. That's where you meet God now, with his people. So what we call worship could also be called meeting with God. And it's come to know, be known as our assemblies. That is where God's people gather to worship him. That's where he's promised to meet with his people, God's house. And that's why we call it God's house. Not because it has a very regal blue carpet down the side. It doesn't matter if you're in Africa and the roof is tin and it's stinking hot. It's not the place. It's the gathered people of God. 
way there in tears to meet you. And the apostles call it God's house. Peter calls it God's house. Paul does. And the letter of Hebrews does. He calls the gathered people of God God's house. Is this God's house? Not when you're not here. It's just a building, brick and mortar. It's God's house when you are here, gathered to worship him. Those assemblies, those who gather to worship are called God's house. That's where he is to be met. If we wish to meet God in this life, might we find him on occasion somewhere else? Yes, you may. In the same way, again, I use the illustration, a human illustration, you might find a dime on a mountaintop. You might. But if you're a coin collector, that's not where you go to find coins. Go to the bank. Go to a coin convention where there are coins. And so it is when we meet with God, we come and gather together. And that illustration is of David Borden, biblical theology and the house of prayer in worship, a book perhaps worth looking at. You don't climb a mountaintop to find a coin if you're a coin collector, but you may find a coin there in the same way. You may meet with God. Paul met with God and Jesus Christ on the Damascus Road and in different places. And, and of course, we mustn't take this uh, illustration too far. He's specifically promoting the practice of corporate worship in the context of those who would reject the importance of God's people meeting together. Of course, we can meet with God in private prayer and group Bible study. He's not playing the significance of such things and, as personal and family worship. Private family worship is vital to our spiritual life and real ways in which we can grow in our relationship with God. The point of this book is that Cruz is making, particularly in this point that we meet with God, is the necessity and the supremacy of public worship. Public worship is to be preferred above private. And so it is with the Lord, so it should be with us. And this is what the Puritan David Clarkson, you may have heard of that Puritan, who sets forth in his famous treatise, expositing Psalm 87 and verse 2. And that, I have not listened to it, but it's well known. Psalm 87 verse 2 said, The Lord loves the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling places of Jacob. And you may go wherever you are on the earth, and the Lord is truly with you. But God has an appointment with you, and he meets with you in the gates of Zion. Where are the gates of Zion? We don't even know where his people meet. That's the gates of Zion, and ultimately in glory in heaven. And in Reformed theology, we refer to what goes on in worship as we gather as the ordinary means of grace. Not the only means of grace, but the ordinary means of grace. And I mentioned Paul on the Damascus Road. Uh, yes, you can sometimes find a dime on a mountaintop, but that random event should not establish your habits as a coin collector. And so the believer is urged, do not forsake the gathering together of his people. Why? Why? If you can meet God anywhere. I'll just have a prayer meeting. I'll just have family worship this Sunday. No, because there is only one place where God guarantees that he will meet you as the saints gather to worship. So too, the true believers build their relationships with God on the certainty of meeting him at his house, not on the vain hopes of running into him somewhere else. In fact, it's interesting to note that most instances in the scripture of men meeting with God, literally meeting with him outside of the gathered worship is when God confronts and God reveals himself, and God arrests people like Moses in the burning bush. He certainly met, met with God, but that was like a dime on the mountaintop. Moses there at the burning bush. Abraham in a far country. Saul on the Damascus Road. And what's also interesting that we see in the New Testament, in the forming of the church, the apostolic age, 
that the Holy Spirit is prevalent. He comes upon people in a wonderful way, in, in, a, in a mighty way, and in different ways with the apostles. And it is generally when people meet for prayer. And Paul and Barnabas set aside for the ministry when the Holy Spirit said, when? When they had met for prayer. And the laying hands on Timothy, as we've seen in the, Paul's letter to Timothy, when the elders laid hands on, where? In that place where God says, I'm there to meet your people. That's where I speak to you. That's where I serve you as my people. That's where I feed you. That's where you speak to me and worship me. But let's turn to the scriptures now. Um, we, we'll, be, we'll be fine with time and see how God met with his people in the Old Testament, firstly, and then secondly, how God meets his people today. And we will find, as we know, that our God is immutable. He is unchangeable. So the God who called his people to meet with him in worship in the temple is the same God today. Really, we worship the same way? God has just made it a lot easier for us, and we'll get to that under the second point. Firstly, meeting with God in the Old Testament. And Cruz, in his book, makes the point that if you were able to speak to an ancient Israelite and say to him that corporate worship is the meeting with God, he wouldn't bat an eyelid because he knew that was true. And the Israelites didn't mean that God wasn't anywhere else. They knew very well that God was with them and that he was the omnipresent God. In fact, when the Lord led them out of Egypt, God was there and how they knew it with that extraordinary event. And when they left Egypt, what was there? A cloud, a pillar of cloud to guide them. Is God with us? He is. Is he meeting with us? No, not in the way of worship. And at night, a pillar of fire in that dramatic way. And they believed that God was with them, present everywhere. But this was not meeting with God. If they wanted to meet with God and, and have a personal encounter with him, God allocated his presence to a certain place in the tent of the meeting. That is where God met his people, the tabernacle. The house of worship is where God could be reached. Would you turn your Bibles if you have them, or you can just make the notes to Exodus chapter 25. I'm going to read a few verses there to prove the point that in the Old Testament, the people of God met with God in his house, in the tabernacle. Verse 8 of chapter 25, he says to Moses, Let them make a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. Oh, but God is in our midst. God is everywhere. Yeah, but this is a meeting place. This is where God guarantees to meet you. Exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furnishes, so you shall make it. And even more specifically, God was to be found at the Ark of the Covenant. You remember this. Chapter, verse 21 and 22 of that same chapter. And you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet with you. And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. That is the only way God commuted in the old, communicated in the Old Testament, met with his people. And when the days of the tabernacle were over and the people had settled in the promised land, God would only meet his people at the place of worship in God's house. And that was the temple. And the temple that Solomon built and the temple housed the Ark of the Covenant. It was a symbol of the presence of God. Is it any wonder then that Uzzah was struck down dead as they walked to transport the ark to the temple. And the oxen stumbled and he reached out his hand and touched the ark. Why? Because that was not God's meeting place. 
God's meeting place for his people was in the temple, in the ark. And the ark, in the Old Testament, the event of the dedication of the temple recalls Solomon's prayer of dedication, further proof that the temple was indeed God's house. Second Chronicles 7, 1 and 2. You needn't turn there. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Why? Because God was showing, this is where I meet my people. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple, and the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. What's the conclusion? Brothers and sisters, the Bible still teaches that God meets his people primarily in God's house. And this is not a house built with brick and mortar as in the Old Testament. But we, the church, are God's house when we gather to worship. For the dwelling of God and the new covenant is with men, and they shall be his people, and he will be their God. So in the Old Testament, God met his people in the temple. Secondly, we meet with God post Christ's resurrection, post apostolic age in the modern world. We meet with God in a better way. In a better way. We may not have tabernacles or temples or arks, but does God still have a house? Does He still meet with us at church when we worship? Yes. Though the mode of meeting with his people is much more simpler. There's no pillar of cloud and fire. There's no consuming fire from heaven. More importantly, there's no washings and ceremonies and multiple things to observe and abstentions from dead bodies and all sorts of things. And more important that there's no more sacrifices day after day. And this is what the book of Hebrews is all about, explaining to the Jewish Christians that there is still a tabernacle. There is still God's house, but it's no longer bricks and mortar. It's where God's people meet and God meets with them. So two sub points under this, how we meet with God. I said that we have a better way and God has given us a better way. Number two, how we meet God's people. And for this, if you want to open your Bibles to Hebrews 10 and 12, we'll look at in a moment, that would be helpful. Or again, you could just write down the verses. How we meet with God. And the writer to the Hebrews, Paul, explains in verses 19 to 20, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to the enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, there was no such confidence until you'd washed and sacrificed, and observed, and the right furnishings at the right place, in the right order, by the new and living way that he opened. God has made it much easier, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and with full assurance of faith. The trembling that accompanied God's presence and the awe was wonderful. And now that way is made easier. It is made open through the blood of Christ so that we can come with a true heart full of assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with his pure water. With his own blood, Christ entered the holy place for all having obtained eternal redemption. The perfect and precious blood of the Son of God, however, unlike the need for repetition in the Old Testament, secures an eternal redemption and purifies for an eternal worship. And that's the place that we come to. How much easier and simpler. Worship that starts here on earth is a constant dress rehearsal for worship above in his house. Though not an ark or a covenant or a, tab or a tabernacle here, but here, but now here on earth we can enter the holy place because we have been cleansed by faith by the blood of our great high priest even when we gather for worship. 
Now think about Paul Skamar. I urge you not to give up the habit of meeting together as some have done. Why? Because if you don't gather, you will not meet with God. If you don't gather to worship, you are not meeting with God. Because then we cease to meet with God in worship and we leave God homeless on earth. Reverently, we leave God homeless on earth when he's given us a place. But it's not a building that he sits and wait for, waits for us. It's, it's not a permanent home. It's where his people are gathered. So when we decide to play golf on the Lord's Day, when we think flippantly of a quick family gathering, that's what we're forfeiting. We leave God homeless in the sense. I quote, drawing near to God means believing the gospel and constantly expressing trust in Jesus and his saving, saving work. And Cruz says that Jesus Christ is the key to opening those holy places of worship and we enter the presence of God through faith with him. This is how we meet with God. Secondly, and finally today, we just about done where we meet with God. Where we meet with God. And you may say you've answered that question, so wherever his people meet, but it's more than that. It's more than that, according to Cruz. Here on earth, God's people meet with him, not in a particular place, or a special building, or like the Samaritan woman, which will be the better mountain to meet on, the best cathedral to meet on, but when God's people gather for corporate worship is where we are promised God will meet with us. Back to Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 1 and 2. Now the point of what we are trying to say is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven, so God is in his true home in heaven, and the majesty on high and the lamb on the throne, a minister in the holy places, in the true tent that God has set up, not man. And Jesus is the true tent. Note how the author of Hebrews equates the holy places with heaven. And he also says that Christ is the true tent. In other words, the real tent of the meeting is now in heaven. It's in heaven. That's where real worship takes place. This is where we meet God, no longer in temples made by man, but in his heavenly sanctuary. Whoa, I thought we were meeting La Marada in our building, which is where God has promised to meet because we gather. Yes, we are. But Cruz says, the believers who come together are drawn in the mysterious work of the Holy Spirit into the heavenly places. Cruz says that's what's happening, that's what's happening when we worship. And that's where worship is happening, in the heavenly places. Hebrews 12 proves this point. Look at verse 18 to 21. For you have not come here to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness, a gloom and a tempest, the sound of the trumpet and a voice whose words the hearers begged that no further messages be spoken to them, for they could not endure the order that was given. Even if a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Now think about this. If our worship location cannot be touched, then that must mean it's a spiritual place. Same chapter, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22. Let's read it. But you have come to Mount Zion. So what is it saying? God meets his people when they gather to worship, but they're actually in Mount Zion. When you come here, we ascend to Mount Zion spiritually because that is God's home. And that is our tent, Jesus Christ. And to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gatherings, and to the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made 
perfect. Those families and friends and saints who have died worshiping around the throne, it's as if we worship with them in Mount Zion when we come to worship God and to Jesus, the author of the new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than Abel. That's what's happening when we worship. We meet God, and we enter by the work of His Spirit and by faith in our hearts into the heavenlies. And no one can tear down this house. They tore down the temple. They can tear down this building, but no one can disrupt true worship because it takes place in heaven. And soon we will meet every saint that has gone before, worship God and the Lamb on His throne. But here on earth we meet with God in His house, and that house is where we gather. That is where worship takes place by faith, spiritually in the heavenlies, and with Jesus who is our tent. And we close, and I want to read the last verses of Hebrews 12. That the writer writes, what's the result? What should we do? Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So when the day comes when Christianity is outlawed in this country, we just meet and we worship God in the heavens. It's a kingdom that cannot be shaken or torn down at all with Jesus. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for God is a consuming fire. And that's how the writer to the Hebrews explains to tabernacle worshipers about the new tabernacle and about the easier, simpler way to worship God. Well, that's all I have, and I'm sure there's lots of uh, food for thought there, and, and we can have some discussion afterwards at our time of fellowship. Next time, the next part of the theology of worship, what happens when we worship, we'll consider part four, the theology of worship, God renews his covenant. But for today, we come back in a few minutes to meet with God. Let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we bless you for your kingdom, which is not an earthly kingdom. We bless you that this place is not important, but the people who gather to worship. Oh, Lord, help us in the time to follow, to realize that we meet with God. He speaks to us. He listens to us. We praise him. He feeds us with the living bread. We truly meet with God and may we in our faith and in our minds rise to the gates of Zion and there worship you in our hearts with all the saints even now gathered around the throne worshiping you day and night. Bless our worship we pray and come and meet with us we pray in Christ's name, amen.